so I would like to start by with a big word of thanks to Dr. Banshi Sabu for inviting me to be present for this meeting again another time. And in fact, I've been to I've been a part of DICAT once several times in the past, and I've always enjoyed the hospitality of Dr. Sabu and his team. So no special thanks for them. Now, the topic for today's discussion is somewhat very interesting. And when Banshi asked me for my opinion, I thought this is something which needs a bit of discussion. Because our background thought process is always like this, that whenever we are thinking in terms of a hypoglycemia, uh, the only thing that comes to our mind is as a part of management or as a complication of diabetes. But unfortunately, or I should say surprisingly, hypoglycemia can occur in a lot of other non-diabetic conditions. And uh, this is something which I'm going to discuss today. And for that, I'm going to take you to several real life case scenarios, one after another. So this is the first case. Uh, Mr. Sen, a megalomaniac, 45 year old accountant, he awoke one morning with uneasy dreams. He was non-diabetic, hypertensive and a heavy alcoholic and smoker. He found himself transported into the bed into a giant cockroach. That's what he felt or feeling very weird. He had recurrent episodes. This was sporadic, but occurred frequently in the mornings and were relieved by breakfast. And the most recent visit occurred two days prior to his clinic visit when Mrs. Sen found her husband happily taking the morning shower in his pajamas and shorts. So he was behaving in an absolutely irrelevant manner. So this was what his presentation was like. So is this hypoglycemia? Well, if you look up at the work of our, uh, Mr. Sen, what we can find out that his fasting plasma glucose done on a subsequent day was 45. And uh, the other work have included the liver function test, the urea and electrolytes and the chest X-ray and the hemogram, everything was essentially unremarkable. So essentially we're dealing with a case of spontaneous hypoglycemia. Now, what exactly do we mean by the spontaneous hypoglycemia? So this is basically the definition of a spontaneous hypoglycemia. It's a clinically relevant hypoglycemia that is characterized by this Weeple's triad. And I'm pretty sure in this audience, we are all familiar with this Weeple's triad. So basically, the patient has got characteristic neuroglycopenic symptoms. What these are, we're going to discuss later on. The patient has got a low blood glucose. Usually, it's less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. And the symptoms are usually resolved with uh, oral glucose treatment or by any treatment which brings the glucose back to normal. So it is very important that this low blood glucose with symptoms must be present to define spontaneous hypoglycemia. Now, is this hypoglycemia fasting or postprandial? There's always a question that comes to your mind. A fasting hypoglycemia is something which usually occurs more than five hours after the intake of the last food and indicates an underlying disease. So this is exactly what we're talking about by the non-diabetic hypoglycemia. Now, this does not mean that hypoglycemia doesn't operate in a fasting state in a diabetic patient. Certainly does. But if the patient doesn't have any such underlying disease, at least apparently, and the patient presents with a fasting hypoglycemia, we have to think of some other secondary cause other than diabetes. Usually, diabetes doesn't present per se as a fasting hypoglycemia. And also, there's another issue known as postprandial or reactive hypoglycemia, which occurs usually two to five hours after the intake of food. And it usually occurs due to an exaggerated insulin response. As for example, and this is typically given the name a dumping syndrome, which happens because of a rapid transit of food through the gastrointestinal tract so that there is an insulin release which occurs earlier than the blood glucose gets a chance to go up. Now, what is a clinically significant hypoglycemia? Why not just a low blood glucose? Now, this was a study which is actually nearly 40 years old today. So this was uh, a study where people looked at the plasma glucose in men and women, normal men and women during a 72 hour fast. And what did they find out? That the lowest average blood glucose dem demonstrated in men was something around 67.5 milligrams per deciliter. And in women, it dropped even further, 41.3. So as you can well appreciate, both these values, 67.5 and 41.3 are well below 70. And by normal definition of hypoglycemia, both these was classified as hypoglycemia. But this was not clinically significant. Why? Because the patients did not have any symptoms. And these were all normal human beings. So you could not think about something like these patients are having a hypoglycemia associated autonomic failure. That's why they're not having symptoms. No, these were all normal 
uh, men and women. So that's why what was the conclusion of the study is that the average blood glucose of a normal individual can vary greatly between uh, the different individuals. Some of them could end up having a very low blood glucose, but that does not define a hypoglycemia. So what is the take spontaneous hypoglycemia? The, what is the first take of message? The blood glucose concentration less than 70 milligram does not necessarily signify disease. And the second take of message is that there should be presence of neuroglycopenia symptoms. So what are these neuroglycopenia symptoms? They include things like fatigue, headache, disorientation, slurred speech, a confusional state, and ultimately leading to a loss of consciousness. And disorders involving life-threatening hypoglycemia may be present in purely neuroglycopenic symptoms, such as bizarre behavior. In other words, what happened in Mr. Sen's case could be a typical presentation of a spontaneous hypoglycemia with neuroglycopenic symptoms. So the second take home message from this is that not all bizarre behavior may be explained by hypoglycemia. Yes, here we have got a documented hypoglycemia, but that does not mean that anybody presenting with a bizarre behavior is having hypoglycemia. Why? Because before you come to rule out spontaneous hypoglycemia, these are things which need to be ruled out. Whether the patient is taking any specific drugs or any toxins, whether the patient has got any organ failure, whether the patient has got any infections or chronic malnutrition, or whether the patient is suffering from any hormonal disorders. It is last bit which will need a little bit of discussions, but other things, other bits, I think all of you know. So basically the commonest glucose lowering therapy that produces hypoglycemia in a non-diabetic patient are insulin and sulfonurias. Often insulin and sulfonurias have been used for suicidal intent by family members of diabetic patient. So if such a patient presents with a hypoglycemia, this is something which needs to be ruled out. This is a known fact that insulin and sulfonuria does produce hypoglycemia. What about the rest? Now, this is actually a big list. I'll not bother you by taking through this big list. But what is interesting to know that certain drugs like the quinolones, quinines, and indomethacin can have been known to produce significant amount of hypoglycemia. Also, alcohol is something which has been known to with hypoglycemia. Drugs like lithium, dextropropoxifen, and rarely some conditions like mifepristone, diastropyramide, and others, they have been seen to be associated with spontaneous hypoglycemia. What about critical organ system failure? In fact, the commonest one that we talk about is renal failure. It is a number one cause of hypoglycemia in hospitalized patients with or without diabetes. And this happens because of the decreased, decreased clearance of insulin. And this decreased clearance of insulin can happen because of a deteriorating renal function and also a decreased gluconeogenesis because of a decreased delivery of alanine from the muscle, which is responsible for this insulin synthesis. The other one is a fulminant hepatic failure, which happens usually in sex setting of an acute fulminant hepatitis, paracetamol toxicity, Ray syndrome, but this is not usually seen with cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis or liver metastasis. In other words, for a hypoglycemia to result from hepatic failure, that hepatic failure has to be acute. It does not usually happen in a chronic hepatic failure. And in severe hepatic heart failure, this has also been noticed, but the exact etiology is unknown. Other infections which can cause hypoglycemia, malaria, particularly in association with quinine therapy, but we must remember that overwhelming sepsis with severe infections usually causes hyperglycemia and not hypoglycemia. There have been reports of chronic malnutrition leading to hypoglycemia. Again, the mechanism is not very clear. It could be increased glucose utilization by muscle following a vigorous exercise. So these are the different causes of spontaneous hypoglycemia, which can happen in non-diabetic individuals. Now let us move on to the endocrine cause of hypoglycemia. So if there is a deficiency of these two different sets of hormones, like the cortisol or the glucagon and the epinephrine, these sort of condition hormones can produce what is known as a hypoglycemia in a non-diabetic individuals. The other one, relatively unusual one, is a non islet cell tumor. But endogenous hyperinsulinism is probably one of the commonest causes, and the commonest cause of that is insulinoma. But there are other conditions, relatively rare ones, like the functional beta cell disorders, like nesidioblastosis, autoimmune hypoglycemia, and so on and so forth. So is the next question that we have to ask when dealing with such a patient is, is fasting hypoglycemia present? If you have ruled out all the other factors that I've discussed so far, 
and the patient is presenting with a spontaneous fasting hypoglycemia, think about insulinoma, insulinoma, insulinoma. So this is the first diagnosis that you have to think about when you've ruled out all the other factors. What next? This non-islet cell tumor hypoglycemia can happen. This is something which we'll discuss later on. Happens as a paraneoblastic phenomena and also autoimmune hypoglycemia. So these are the other endocrine causes of fasting hypoglycemia. Now, what is insulinoma? It's basically the bad boy of spontaneous hypoglycemia. It's a relatively rare, one in a million case annual incidence. It's usually spontaneous hypoglycemia. It's usually localized in one focus, but around 10% of insulinoma can be multifocal, usually in association with multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. Usually, it's a benign adenoma, very rarely malignant. It's rarely seen outside the pancreas, but in around 1% patient, patients, we have citromacros insulinoma, or there is an, uh, of this uh, insulinoma outside the pancreas. And most of this insulinoma are very small. In fact, 30% are less than one centimeter. And this is classically associated with a fasting hypoglycemia. Now, one may wonder why really bother about something so rare? The answer is because miss it, it can kill your patient. Not from anything else, because as I told you, the tumor is usually benign, but from a persistent hypoglycemia, which can have all the deadly complications and sequelae of hypoglycemia. So insulinoma, the clinical presentation is again primarily with the symptoms of neuroglycopenia. So basically, if you go back again to the case of Mr. Sen, who was taking a shower in his pajamas and short. So if you now analyze all his symptoms, he has got all the typical neuroglycopenic symptoms like confusion and bizarre behavior. And it's provoked by fasting and it's relieved by with orange juice and breakfast. So this, it fulfills all the uh, typical uh, criteria for Whipple's triad. So obviously this gentleman was suffering from spontaneous hypoglycemia. So what do we do from there? How do you diagnose? The gold standard for the diagnosis is a 72 hour fast. Now, how do you do that? So basically the basis is demonstration of an inappropriate endogenous insulin production in the presence of a clinically relevant hypoglycemia that is Whipple's triad. And how does, what is the protocol for doing a 72 hour fast? Uh, basically, you have to hospitalize the patient. This is a test you cannot do at home and fast the patient up to 72 hours. The patient can have just pure drink, pure water and nothing else. Ensure that the patient is not being smuggled in to have any food from outside because often the patient will feel hungry. You check the blood glucose every two to four hours and monitor for the hypoglycemic symptoms. And in the presence of, of symptoms of uh, hypoglycemic symptoms, or in the presence of a documented low blood glucose, as you can find out from capillary blood glucose, draw at least two sets of bloods for blood glucose, serum, insulin, and C-peptide. And subsequently, give the glucose and check for the resolution of symptoms that is confirming the Whipple's triad. Some of these patients, you may have to stop early if there's more than 3% of body weight loss following the 72-hour fast. And the sensitivity of this test in picking up high insulinoma is more than 95%. So basically, how do you distinguish between insulinoma, insulinoma and surreptitious insulin use? What about somebody who is using insulin surreptitiously to produce hypoglycemia? So when an insulinoma, the glucose is low, the insulin is high, the C-peptide is high. Uh, when it's a surreptitious insulin use, the insulin glucose is low, the insulin is high, and the C-peptide is low. And this is because with exogenous insulin administration, Endogenous insulin production and production of C-peptide and pro-insulin is suppressed. So the C-peptide levels are low. What about if it's a sulfonuria? What happens when it's a sulfonuria-induced spontaneous hypoglycemia? It's the glucose is low. Insulin is high because of the stimulation by sulfonuria. And the C-peptide is also high. So this is essentially the difference between insulin-induced hypoglycemia and sulfonuria-induced hypoglycemia where the C-peptide level is high. But then the issue comes regarding the distinction between insulinoma and sulfonuria, because in both these conditions, the glucose is low, the insulin is high, and the C-peptide is high. So how do you diagnose? So you tell them apart by doing a serum or urine sulfonuria screen and find out whether the urine contains a sulfonuria metabolite.
The final localization of an insulinoma comes from the CT scan of abdomen. This was the CT scan of abdomen of Mr. Sen, which showed the presence, as you can see here, the area of uh, insulinoma. And basically, these patients, as I mentioned, have got very high insulin levels. And anything like a spinal CT or an arteriography can pick up this area. Ultrasonography was used in the olden days, but not a very good treatment of choice. And once you have localized the tumor, the next treatment is enucleation and recurrence at 10 years uh, is enucleation. However, this is not, in most of the cases, it does uh, cure the patient, but there is actually a risk of uh, recurrence at 10 years. And this is around 6% at 10 years and around 10% at 20 years. So once the patient had an insulinoma, this patient should be kept under follow-up with periodic regular reviews. Now, Mr. Sen underwent an enucleation and the symptoms result completely. And this patient, as I told you, he has been free from symptoms for the last 14 years. As I shown in the CT, he had the symptoms in 2008. And now he's perfectly all right. Even after 14 years, he's doing perfectly all right. Let's move on to case number two. So this is a 55-year-old male gentleman, known hypertension, which was poorly controlled. He was admitted with our, to our National Neuroscience and Center, that is NNC which is uh, one of the intensive neuro care units of the PLS hospital with a right middle cerebral artery infarct. He was a heavy smoker and he presented with recurrent hypos and he was extremely lethargic and listless. Case number three, a similar patient admitted with a left middle, middle cerebral artery infarct, known hypertension. He developed a CVA after an episode of diarrhea and was admitted with a gross dyselectrolytemia, sodium of 115, potassium of 2.9, and during his stay in the hospital, he was troubled by recurrent hypos. He was extremely lethargic and was unable to communicate despite having no speech difficulty. Case number three, Mr. Gosal, a 78-year-old widow male, lived with his nephew, hypertensive for 20 years and dyslipidemic for 10 years on adequate treatment. He had two CVS in 2005-2006. In 2006, he was admitted with hypoglycemia. And again, was noted to have an extensive left internal capsule and basal ganglia infarct. Several hypoglycemic episodes in patient, alert, but vaguely responsive even when clinically stabilized. He looked depressed. So one common factor about both all these three cases was that they had presented with an infarct. They did not have diabetes. They had background hypertension. One of them had dyslipidemia as well. Now, during an episode of hypoglycemia, when the lab glucose was less than four, this was the results of the different pituitary hormone profiles, the growth hormone and the cortisol. And as we can see in all three of them, both the growth hormone and the cortisol levels were suppressed. So obviously these patients were suffering from some degree of hypopituitarism. Now, just a bit of a statistics, the average annual incidence of hypopituitarism is four per one lakh. And hypopituitarism usually develops predictably with growth hormone deficiency characteristically preceding the gonadotropin deficiencies and subsequently followed by a depletion of the TSH and acetate reserves. So both growth hormone de deficiency and the acetate deficiency can cause spontaneous hypoglycemia. These are the causes of hypopituitarism which can happen. Important to note that a cerebral infarction, like what happened here, also causes uh, hypopituitarism. Now, remember something, all these patients had uh, cerebral infarcts in the middle cerebral artery tertiary. As we all know, the anterior cerebral artery drains into the circular villus and supplies the middle cerebral artery. So if the circulation of the circular, uh, circular villus is compromised due to any reason whatsoever, that can also lead to what is known as a subclinical pituitary hypoperfusion, pituitary ischemia, and in the long run, pituitary infarction. And it is seen from this particular study that isolated growth hormone deficiency can happen with multiple growth, uh, horm pituitary hormone deficiencies. So this, all these hormone deficiencies, particularly ACTH deficiency and growth hormone deficiency are well known to produce um, hypoglycemias. So basically these are the ways by which you can diagnose it in such patients going for insulin tolerance tests uh, or the growth hormone receptor hormone uh, arginine, arginine, or glucagon clonidine tests. Uh, and this is how you do, you do go for a growth hormone assessment. And some other biochemical markers which might help here is the IGF-1 and the IGF-PP3. The gold standard is ITT, but again, this requires 
a very intensive setup and a properly trained uh, technicians to do it and should be avoided in patients who have undergone a cerebral infarct or a myocardial infarct. Um, it basically distinguishes the growth hormone deficiency from that due to aging and obesity. And as I mentioned, it is should be performed in units adequately experienced. It's contraindicated in non ischemic heart disease and seizure disorders. And this is what an insulin hypoglycemia test, this is how it differs. Basically, if a patient is normal, this is what... I'm sorry. Uh, if uh, the insulin, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side of the panel, you have got the normal response of the plasma glucose, cortisol, and growth hormone with a hypoglycemia, following hypoglycemia. In a hypopituitary state, with both the cortisol as well as the serum growth hormone, there is a flat response. So this is one of the ways by which you can find out whether the patient is really having a hypopituitary induced hypoglycemia. So what happened finally in these three patients? So case two and case three were started on growth hormone and cortisol replacement. Case four could not afford a growth hormone replacement. It marked improvement in alertness and for at least two to three years follow up, these patients were on the growth hormone and cortisol replacement. There was reduced incidence of hypoglycemia. The alertness improved but the neurological status, including the neuro deficits resulting from the stroke, it was unaltered. But despite that, the patients looked much better. And there was an increase in the muscle bulk in these patients. There was a reduced hypos. And generally, the patients were doing fine. And they were followed up for the next five years. And reasonably, they were doing pretty fine. Another condition which can lead to hypo spontaneous hypoglycemia in a non diabetic patient is adrenal insufficiency. It usually produces mild hypoglycemia in adults, but it, in children, it can be severe. Primary adrenal insufficiencies can occur in conjunction with type 1 diabetes, and it can be present with a decreased insulin requirement and frequent hypoglycemia. And the mechanism is usually the decreased delivery of the gluconeogenic precursors to liver and or decreased synthesis of epinephrine or decreased induction of the N-methyltransferase. So adrenal insufficiency in children may present as a spontaneous hypoglycemia, particularly in conjunction with type, two, type 1 diabetes. Um, and the important point is that hypothyroidism and early diabetes mellitus usually does not cause a spontaneous hypoglycemia. Early diabetes mellitus can present with a reactive hypoglycemia, but not with a spontaneous fasting hypoglycemia. Then we have got other non beta cell tumors. Again, that list is uh, not a huge, the, the, the list is big but the incidence is much less. Large mesenchymal tumors like retroperitoneal sarcoma, intraabdominal and intrathoracic sarcoma, mesothelioma, these can all present with hypoglycemia. Hepatocellular carcinoma, adrenal carcinoma, malignant carcinoid tumors, pheochromocytoma, and some certain lymphomas, myeloma and leukemia, they can all present with hypoglycemia. But as I mentioned, the incidence of this last, the hematomalignant disorders, hematological malignant disorders, are relatively extremely rare. This leaves us with a really truly weird cases of fasting hypoglycemia. One of them is the nesidioblastosis or the islet cell hyperplasia. It represents a hyperplastic process of budding islet cells from ducts, or this is known as nesidioblastosis. And nowadays, this is interpreted as a precursor to men or multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. And heterozygous knockout of the MEN1 gene in the mouse show multiple giant hyperplastic islets that precede the insulinoma. So this actually could be one of the precursors of an insulinoma. And persistent hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia of infancy is uh, in these in infants have an identifiable genetic mutations in the sulfonylurea receptor 1, that is SUR1, and also in the KIR6.2 or in the glucokinase gene. So these patients are, because of this genetic mutations, they can present with increased tendency of hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia in infants. Then we have got this autoimmune hypoglycemic syndromes. It is usually because of the anti-insulin receptor antibodies. It was first described in individuals with extreme insulin resistance. However, they can be seen in association with type 1 diabetes. And these are characterized by extreme hyperglycemia, alternating with refractory hypoglycemia. The hyperglycemia can shoot the blood glucose more than 500 milligrams per deciliter. On the hypoglycemia, this refractory hypoglycemia can shoot it down to below 20. It's extremely rare, as I told you, 
less than 100 cases have, have been reported in literature, and it typically causes fasting hypoglycemia. So the final take home message is that evaluation of hypoglycemia in a non-diabetic individual is a serious brainstorming session. It's easy to diagnose hypoglycemia in a diabetic patient, but when you are dealt with, uh, when you're coming across a non-diabetic patient, this hypoglycemia management becomes an extremely tough and brainstorming job. It becomes almost like a detective story, like what happened in the case of Mr. Sen. We have to think about non-endocrine causes first, like renal and fulminant hepatic failure, also sepsis. This can produce, these are more commoner causes of uh, non-diabetic non hypoglycemia. And adrenal diabetes, adrenal insufficiency, and hypopetrotism with growth hormone deficiency usually causes less severe hypoglycemia. But as I showed in those three cases, these are rare, uncommon, but not unknown. And do not forget insulinoma as a curative cause of spontaneous, severe, non-diabetic hypoglycemia. So with that, I end my presentation. And if there's any question, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much.